This episode of Fireside Chat is brought to you by Robert Woodward, lawyer at Altador Law. He specializes in family law, wills, and estates for flame fans in Calgary and Southern Alberta. Call Robert at 403-771-2187 and mention Fireside Chat to get $100 off any legal service. Are you ready? See you, Brad. It's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Well, the Flames didn't get an Academy Award on Sunday night, but on Monday they ended up getting their Oscar as uh, the Calgary Flames make one trade deadline move to bring in Oscar Fattenberg on defense. But, Matt, let's start by talking about the deadline. We'll swing back to the games from last week after that. Flames make one move, trading a conditional fourth-round pick in uh, 2020 for Oscar Fattenberg from L.A. The condition on the pick is if the Flames make the conference final and... Fantenberg plays in half of their playoff games. The fourth rounder becomes a third rounder. So I have a feeling it's going to end up being a fourth rounder. Yeah. Um, let's And uh, just for the record, Fantenberg will wear number three as a flame. Kind of interesting because his defensive partner in L.A. this year has been Dion Phaneuf, who also wore number three as a flame. Um, overall, thoughts on this Fantenberg deal? Uh, Fattenberg, I liked him last year when he uh, was in the playoffs with the LA Kings. Uh, the Kings got swept in their series, but he was one of the few bright spots on the team. Uh, he hasn't played a ton in the NHL. This is only his second season. 73 He's, total games. Yeah, uh, and he doesn't have uh, awesome numbers. I think he has like two goals and an assist this year or something like that. But he's not... It, like, from what Kings fans say, he's not bad at anything, and he's not great at anything. He's just solid all the way around, and he goes out there and he is boring. Which, for a number six, seven, eight, nine defenseman like Fantenberg will be, that's exactly what you want. You want him to be like Dalton Prout when he gets inserted into the game, where he just does a solid job, he's okay, and that's all. For those that don't know Fattenberg, he's a Swedish player, 27 years old, uh, has play, been in the L.A. system for a couple of years now. He's a defenseman who shoots left, six foot, 209 pounds. Um, he, he's played in Sweden most of his career, came over to North America in 2017-2018, where he played 27 NHL games, got a total of nine points with the Kings, 25 AHL games, got 13 points with the Ontario Reign, and then this season... As I mentioned, he's been paired with Dion Phaneuf for a bit. He's played 46 games, two goals, one assist for three total points, and 10 penalty minutes. So, as Matt mentioned, he's a puck-moving defenseman. Um, league minimum salary cap hit of 650000 which expires this summer, so a cheap rental. And honestly, I think that if he plays all right or better i think the, the flames will just offer him another contract for another year or two considering we need some defensive bodies right now yeah and like usually good teams when they go on a long playoff run you usually need seven eight nine to play at least one game and you know after you get past prout and stone the depth on defense is a bunch of guys that are not very good so well, when we talked about that last week and one of the big things you wanted the team to bring in was that depth defenseman so you think this yeah. meets that need yeah and frankly i'd slot him in above prout and basically on par with stone stone's a righty he's the lefty equivalent i honestly i don't think he plays more than six or seven games the rest of the way and he'll, I think he's just going to be the number seven and wait and see until the playoffs, basically. I wouldn't be surprised if we see him play a lot in late March, early April when they start to shut down some of their good players. Yeah, I can agree with that. So that's the only thing the Flames did today. I guess we're done our deadline episode, Matt. Yeah, that, that was a long and exciting episode. We'll talk to you next uh, week after the Jersey retirement for Jerome. <laughs> No, let's yeah, uh, well, let's look well, at some of what didn't happen. Yeah, it was a weird deadline, but you know, I'm frankly I do not mind the fact that the Flames only added Fantenberg. For the price of what stuff was going for, I'm glad they didn't add more. The one thing that does surprise me though 
Earlier in the week, Devontae Smith Pelly was on waivers. Nobody put in a claim for him. And I was surprised. I thought that would be a good depth forward for the Flames. He's on a million dollar deal, expiring forward. Why not get a guy like that for free? Yeah. Uh, well, I think that teams uh, might have wanted to trade uh, with Washington to send a contract their way. Uh, Smith Pelly has been frankly horrible this season and he was during the regular season last year and he just happened to be the Capitals version of Fernando Pisani during the playoffs but he didn't play very well this year and that's why they waived him and he was so bad that nobody claimed him which I agree I would have you know I would have expected at least one team would have put a claim in on I can just see nobody trading for him but if you can get him for no acquisition cost why not it, it's a little weird but so that was one that was one thing I was surprised the flames passed like I didn't think when when I saw him on waivers I thought the flames should put in a claim but there's no way it would even get to them and then I look and I'm like what nobody put in a claim what the heck's going on here yeah well he would have been a decent physical like 13th 14th forward but it, it's one of those where we missed out, but does it really matter? Not really. Like, it, it's a small thing, but it, you know, it, it's not the end of the world. No, and I just, I guess the biggest thing for me was the acquisition cost. I liked that the acquisition cost would have been nothing. Yeah. So that uh, Ryan Stone deal, or Mark Stone, I should say, uh, yeah, that one... Uh, with Vegas signing him for eight years at nine and a half million dollars, I am glad that the Flames did not get him for that. Well, and I have to think that the Flames, I mean, for how quickly that deal was done, I have to think the teams that were in on Stone, which if you listen to the media reports were Vegas, Calgary, Winnipeg, talked to him ahead of time, knew what it would take, and you know, right away said, yeah, we're not doing this. Yeah, it just doesn't make any sense. Both you would have in had terms to pick of what- Stone or Kachuk. Yeah, and it, there are better ways of using assets. And Stone is an awesome player, and Vegas is a better team. But, you know, frankly, like, Yusuf Valimaki, when I see him play, I see a f- future number one defenseman on the Flames, or first pairing at a minimum. He's a very good player. And... Do you really want to gamble losing that for a guy who's not the fleetest of foot for eight years on a deal that'll take him till he's 35? So just to reference what Matt's talking about, the news reports came out that the big sticking point with Calgary and Ottawa was that Ottawa wanted Valimaki and Calgary wasn't interested in parting with that asset. Yeah, and we even said, like I said last week, that like if anybody asked for any of the four good young defensemen that we have, I just you know walk away, and because those guys are vastly more important than any random forward that you can get, and it it sucks that he goes to a division rival, but at the end of the day our defensemen are more important to us moving forward. And, like, we can always get another player that's during free agency or at the draft. Well, that's it. And if you look at the guys that are out there, and we'll get to this in just a second, but if you look at the guys we've talked about and what they got traded for, I think there's going to be some decent-priced free agents available July 1st. Even if we don't trade at the draft, I think you'll be able to pick up a guy like, um, you know, Simmons, Delzato, Zuccarello, somebody cheap in the summer if you want to. Oh, for sure. And, you know, like you look at uh, Gustav Nyquist, who went to San Jose, they're not going to be able to re-sign all of their players. Like, they have five or six really good top-notch free agents at the end of the year. And, of course, they went all in this year to try and win it because they're kind of screwed after the season. And they're going to have to retool much like the Ducks did after their championship window went out and you know the flames are going to have opportunities if they they can sign one of those guys or like they're not going to have to worry about san jose nearly as much moving forward 
Like, this is their last real kick in the can. And the Flames having that first-round pick, especially at the draft, like, teams are... It's currency. Yeah, and you can use that first-round pick, and frankly, you'll get a better player. Well, that's what we've seen Tree do, right? I mean, when was the last time we drafted in the first round? Yeah, well, like, you look at uh, getting Hamannick, that was a very good use of a first-round pick. He's been a top-notch defenseman, and I expect that we'll re-sign him next year because he's not going to be too much more expensive than he already is. And uh, you look at uh, getting Dougie Hamilton, that turned into getting Hannafin. So, you know, like you can get high-quality players because teams are wanting to change their direction. And, you know, you don't have to pay $9.5 million for eight years to get the guy and you know like it just it doesn't make any sense before we talk about other teams in the summer let's circle back to the flames here um don maloney was telling ryan leslie uh today moments ago he told leslie the flames were in on something big last night but it fell apart and that was referring to sunday nights you have to imagine that was probably the stone thing and i imagine where it fell apart was both the term to resign and the fact that they wanted valamaki don't you agree Oh, for sure. And, you know, sometimes you have to know, you know, to borrow Kenny Rogers quote, uh, you have to know when to hold them and you have to know when to fold them. And, you know, the flames, uh, the pot was too big for what they were, what they had. And it just didn't make any sense. And, uh, you know, like I don't, regret the fact that they lost out on stone or any of the other free agents that are to be that are on the that were traded at the deadline because of the fact that the prices just didn't make sense speaking of knowing when to fold them this is an interesting one apparently the calgary flames had a deal done with minnesota uh to bring jason zucker to town and it's rumored by lebron and a few others who've talked about it the return was our first round pick plus for a leak and Zucker's under long-term deal. So that wouldn't have been a rental. Um, I'm not, I don't know what they see in Zucker that is so much better than for leak. You'd give up the first plus. What do you think? Uh, he's a better goal scorer, frankly. And Still. he's basically for leak who can be a 30 goal scorer. And isn't that what James Neal's supposed to be? True. But Neal, Frankly, Neil's just been off. I think that like next season, Neil's going to basically be back to his usual self. I don't see him like regressing to the extent where like he's no longer an NHL player. You're you're not consistent throughout your career, and then just have your entire talent set evaporate overnight. Like it just doesn't happen like that. So I think that he'll bounce back, especially with the fact that he had two runs to the finals in consecutive years. Like, he didn't really have any time to recuperate, so it's not really a big shock that Neil's struggled thus far it this year. It just seems to make a big return for Jason Zucker, and I'm glad we didn't end up paying that. Uh, if that deal had went down, I actually would have been perfectly fine with it. Yeah, I would have been okay with a lower round draft pick, even a second if they had one. But the first well, Zucker's under me. Zucker's under control for another four years after that. So you're getting a high end first second line winger for four years for a first round a late first round pick, and a guy that's you know had issues earlier this season with the coaching staff. So you know it's it wouldn't have been the end of the world like it. You wouldn't have been jumping for joy at losing the first, but it, like if the Flames revisit that trade at the draft and that's what it ends up being, I'd be perfectly fine with that. And that's what, what I was going to say is I can see this deal happening maybe in the summer. Um, if it didn't happen today, I, I think Zucker would be a good fit on this team. And I wouldn't be surprised if this deal is not the last we hear of it. I think this might, like you said, come back at the draft. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised, especially because he's a bit of a physical player, too. And he's kind of one of those players who does everything kind of well. He's not, like, overly exceptional at any one thing except for his shot. So it's one of those things that he's a definitely a good option moving forward. But we'll see, you know, like, other players come available at the draft. You just never know what teams are going to do. 
Well, and the nice thing with Zucker is you you know what it's going to cost. Like the Flames need some cost certainty. It's not that much more than uh, Froelich. So if you can do one, you can do the other. So that's some of the nice thing there is they get that cost certainty. But I'm not sure they want to take on a $5 million contract for four more years. I think they're already going to be pushing it next year. Well, they can handle that if they, you know, because like I'm kind of expecting that TJ Brody will not be a member of the team next year. So, and I'm expecting that uh, they will like reallocate his funds elsewhere and allow the four young defensemen to play full-time roles on the team. So, we'll see. I think you'll end up re- reallocating most of those funds to Kachuk. Oh, the Flames will have cap room for Kachuk anyway, so it's not that big of a deal. Between Kachuk and a goalie, I think you're going to run short on money. And not really. Like, if they, if they move Stone for literally anything... That, that's your cap right there. If they can so. move stone. I just don't know if you're going to move stone without taking something bad back. That's the kind of deal you do at the deadline, not at the draft. Well, stone's been out for most of the year, so... That's what I mean, not this the, year, but you might have to hang on to him until next deadline to get anything out of him. Yeah, we'll see. I wouldn't be shocked if they, they moved him at the at the draft. But we'll see. It, it's one of those things that we just don't know what's on the table. And, like, frankly, I wouldn't be shocked if the Flames uh, used, like, Brody f- to get another first-round pick if they wanted to go that route. Because um, he would get a first plus at the draft. So, you know, it. we'll see. It's... Wait and see how he does in the playoffs, and that could up his value as well. Exactly. Because I think that a lot of Brody's value is tied with being partnered with Giordano. And he has looked very good before and after getting placed with Giordano. And he struggled when he wasn't with them. So, you know, and the fact that the Flames have four really good young defensemen, it's better to save money on the back end if you can. Well, Matt, let's look at some of these names we've talked about in the past, potentially as Flames, and see what we think of the return on them. Um, if you think the Flames should have been in on any of these guys at this price or not. And let's start with one of the guys I hoped would be a Flame, and that was Ryan Dezingle out of Ottawa. He ended up going to Columbus for Anthony Duclair and two second rounders, a 2020 and a 2021. We don't have our 2020, uh, but let's say we gave up the next two seconds we had. Who do you think is the Flames comparable to Duclair? Uh, probably, uh, Quine, I guess. Like, I don't know if he's that bad. Yeah, he is. <laughs> I was thinking a roster guy like a Hathaway or a Zarnik. Yeah, that could be. Uh, it, it's not anybody noteworthy. I think you, you pretty much paid one second round pick too much in this deal. I think, you know, if we look at it as a Zarnik in a second, I would have done that deal. Yeah. Well, the thing is with the Zingle, I'm always leery of lesser talented players that are playing well on a bad team because they have a bad habit of falling flat on their face once they get to their new team. And like the Zingle when Ottawa was good was playing on the fourth line. And then they lost most of their team cuz they're they their management's awesome and you know he they have to put somebody out there and uh, you know i'm not overly confident that he's more than like what curtis glencross was and you know do you want to spend two second round picks on that no not really well that's why like i said i think one second what i mean if we traded a second for lazar i think you know a second and let's say you know, um, Zarnik is a reasonable return for Dezingle. Yeah, and I do think that Columbus overpaid, but like San Jose, they're going all in because they're going to be in a world of hurt after the season. Well, speaking of San Jose, one of your favorite players on the list, Gustav Nyquist, went there, and uh, the return was a second and a third. Um, the third can turn into a second if all the conditions are met. I think that's a pretty reasonable price for Nyquist. I would have paid that easily, but I 
he had a no trade clause. Maybe Calgary asked, and he didn't want to come here. Because that's about the only reason why I could see why the Flames didn't. Because they could have easily just thrown their first at Detroit, and that would have easily trumped what they got. So it is what it is, but, you know, I I think it was more that Nyquist didn't want to come here than anything. Um, Well, I know the tree said he wouldn't do the first four a rental. So my guess is if they were going to do the Nyquist deal, they'd want to lock him up and maybe he was willing to come, but didn't want to commit. Yeah. And in which case, fine, you know, have fun in San Jose for two months and well, and you can always, you can always make a pitch for him again, July 1st. Exactly. And he would be like my number one target in free agency if he gets there, but we'll see. Another guy who I thought had a pretty reasonable return. Uh, Matt Zuccarello went from the Rangers to Dallas and again a conditional second conditional third um 2019 2020 picks there so I thought again a fairly reasonable price I would have paid that price for Zuko and it's disappointing with him because of the fact that he only missed like 12 games in his career or something ridiculously small like that he plays one game for Dallas and breaks something in his leg or he He's out for like a month. I can't remember what the exact injury is. So he's basically out for the rest of the season. It's like... Good thing he didn't move the family over Yeah, there. it's like, um, well, that's great. You know, take those draft picks and just throw them in the toilet there. Because, you know, like that. I think one of those picks becomes the first if they re-sign him. Which, you know, I... You know, they might just because, you know, how disappointing would that be to get, like, one game out of the guy and <laughs> that's it? Yeah, it's it's too bad. But, again, a, a price that I would have been fine with the Flames paying. I wouldn't. Uh, two first-round picks, like, because, like, they're both... It was a second, well, was a second and a third. Yeah, I know, but the conditions are if uh, Dallas gets to the conference finals... And, like, I'm sure that the terms would have been similar, like, if Calgary got to the conference finals. Yeah, in that case, I'm not... And then, then you're right. and re-signing them would have been a first as well, and, like, that's yeah. that's too much. Like, a second and that third in and of itself, sure, fine, no problem, done deal, but the potential of that being two first-round picks, uh, no. <laughs> Right from the beginning of the season, when we've been talking about goaltending, one of the names I threw around early in the season was Keith Kincaid out of New Jersey. Really shocked to see him go to Columbus for a fifth-round pick. They've now got three goalies. When I saw that, I thought, oh, they're moving Bobrovsky for sure. Another name, I would have happily paid a fifth to get some insurance goaltending here. Um, He's been horrible this year, and... I, his goals against is like 3.36 or something like that. And I would feel more comfortable trying him out than promoting uh, Gillies. If Smith and Riddick hadn't played well, uh, I would be more leaning to, you know, we need a body. But Smith, for the last five games that he's played, and Riddick yesterday against Ottawa played very well. So, like, there's not really any urgency. And also in Stockton, uh, both Gillies and Parsons have really turned their seasons around and are, are playing exceptional of late. So, you you know, it, if it, it's one of those things where goaltending has been a problem all year, but it seems like it's all sorted itself out on its own. So... <laughs> It's frustrating, but... I don't know. For for the fifth, though, I'm almost thinking the insurance price was worth it. Yeah. It, you also, like, if you do that, you're sending a message that we don't trust you to both the goalies. And I, I'd i rather, you know, especially with them playing well, you know, I have confidence in you guys. That, that just, you know, you're playing well... Having confidence in you guys, that allows you to be confident that, hey, they trust me, so I'm going to go and kick some ass. And, you know, it's it, if they, they were not doing well, then I think the Flames make a trade for a goalie. But it, it just, I think at this point, because of the bounce back of Smith and Riddick, that it would have sent a bad message. 
So talking about those low round picks, then uh, we saw Kincaid go for a fifth. Delzato went for a sixth. Again, that seems like an insanely cheap price. Well, there's a reason for that. Delzato's not very good. Yeah, but I mean, he went for cheaper than Fantenberg. Yeah, because Fantenberg's better. <laughs> you know, it's Fantenberg. He is not a high profile. You know, because like Delzato used to be a top pairing defenseman, but uh, Fantenberg at this point. I find he's a more well-rounded player. Frankly, I'm a bit shocked that LA traded him because of the fact that like they're kind of going into a rebuild mode and you'd think that a cheap, decent defenseman would have been someone you keep around for three or four years while you're retooling. You know, maybe they talked to him, he didn't want to come back, so they figured let's call somebody up to take that role. Yeah, true enough. But, yeah, and with him, like I'm fine... You know, if the Flames got Delzato for a six, that would have been fine. It, like, there's nothing wrong with that. For the guy who's going to play the eight nine position, I think, you know, we've talked about sort of the power of veterans in the past. I think Delzato might have been a good pickup for that reason. Yeah, and I think Fantenberg. The difference is, is that Fantenberg, you're going to keep him for a while. I don't see the Flames just turfing him at the end of the year. I think he's going to be a three or four year player for the team as like the six seven guy. And then the last one, the one that really surprised me on this list, was uh, Wayne Simmons moving for Ryan Hartman and a conditional fourth. And again, I look at that. Hartman's a 20-point guy this year. So compare him to what, like uh, Hathaway? Uh, well, he's better than Hathaway. Um, if you basically split the difference in abilities between Sam Bennett and Garnett Hathaway, that's Hartman. And like the... The, the pred- so give him Hathaway and Lazar. <laughs> it, well, Hartman's not a bad like he's. It would basically be a young version of Derek Ryan, to with a physical edge and you know like that's a useful piece and like I think Nashville paid a first round pick for Hartman not that long ago. Yeah, they did. So you know, and he's a very solid role player on the team and. You'd almost have to trade Bennett in that trade for Simmons, and like to get an equivalent asset, and like that's way too much. Did it seem to you this year like the selling prices, kind of looking back at the deadline now, were cheaper than other years? It seems to me like you know even the I think the Stone deal was a pretty reasonable deal. I felt like everybody went cheap today. Uh reasonable ish, uh, you know like. With caveats, like it, I think, like if you had just bought Stone as a rental, I think that the cost would have been actually more than they got. Um, but you know, saying that hey, we're gonna be committing like seventy-five million dollars or whatever it is to Stone, like seventy-six, that you know, like that lowers the cost of acquisition, like where. Yeah, uh, you look at um, Duchesne, like, I don't expect Columbus to re-sign Duchesne. So, you know, it's one of those things where, yeah, some players went for cheap, others didn't, but... But overall in the day, I feel like it was a cheaper deadline for buyers than we've seen a lot in the past. Yeah, I think so as well. So, Matt, we saw a lot of the guys we talked about, Dezingle, Nyquist, Zuccarello, you know, a lot of these guys and others that we didn't talk about. The asking price was at least a second. And this year, the Flames don't have their second rounder. How much do you think not having that 2019 second rounder maybe affected their ability to get stuff done? Because you would have had to up, up it to a first, and we know they didn't want to do that. Yeah, I think one or two of those players uh, would have been heading our way instead of wherever they went if the flames had their second rounder but it is what it is and we use those picks well it's just that unfortunately we don't have it right now and missed out on some players but at the end of the day it's not that big of a deal like the way i look at it is the flames have a good crop of young players in the organization both at the NHL level and in the coming ranks. And we still have a first-round pick. We have a third, I do believe. And 
you know, like we have some good quality picks, and if we use them, we're gonna get high quality players. Like it, the scouting staff has made very good selections the last handful of years, getting a lot of high quality players, and you know, there's not we're not really desperately like we're not Edmonton where basically every pick outside of the top five is a guaranteed bust you know like we've got guys like Parsons who's doing well Dubay's doing well uh Anderson and Shillington are doing awesome for second round picks you know uh you'll you go down the line Fox he's well and that's why we've been comfortable giving away those firsts when we have is that they know that they've been able to you know use their seconds their thirds their fourths to still get some really good players yeah and like you look at the past draft the sixth and seventh pit round picks uh Pedersen he's doing amazing in the NCAA and Zav Grevny's looking like more li- like a second round pick than the seventh and even Pospisil's not doing too yeah. bad. Yeah, so like it's one of those things where they got fortunate, frankly, last draft, despite not having any higher end picks, and now we're getting some high end picks. So if the trend continues, where we're getting high quality players with those picks, which you'd have to assume with the same scouting staff that they would, then there's nothing really to worry about you're going like with that late first round pick we're gonna get somebody that's at least on par talent wise with dylan dubay and he's looking like a very good possible middle six forward moving forward i think the flames are at a position in their i guess let's call it their building cycle where they need to start hanging on to some picks i mean we saw even at rookie camp last year there weren't a lot of guys around and yeah, we can sign college free agents, as you mentioned, and that sort of thing. But I think it, in the next couple of years, they just need to make some picks. Oh, for sure. And the Flames are kind of... Like, I don't think you'll see them move a first and a second again in the draft this no, year. No, unless you're getting a good young player that's already in the NHL. Like, if you're getting basically like a Dougie Hamilton as a forward type situation... I think if they're going to make a deal like that at the draft, they do it for a goalie. Possibly. Yeah, I could see that. Um, you know, I think they're happy with their blue line. They're happy with their top six, like where you would get that, where they'd be willing to make that kind of a commitment, I think would be a net this year. Yeah. And I can see that, but the flames are in a bit of a weird spot compared to everyone else, frankly, in the NHL, where basically all of our guys are on good long-term contracts, except for Kachuk. And even he's not going to be commanding more than 8 million a year. And you look at like other teams. Winnipeg's going to be running out of cap space because they got to re-sign Lene and a whole bunch of other guys. San Jose, they're on like imminently on rebuild mode. Nashville, they're kind of capped out at where they're going to be. Well, even in the East, a team like Columbus who made moves to kind of say, "This is our last ditch effort. Let's do this now." Yeah, and like the rest of the west like vegas they're well situated they're pretty much the only other team in the west that's well situated dallas is going to be retooling i think if they go out early and like all the rest of the teams kind of below that kind of suck in various ways and like each has their own story but they're all kind of mediocre and calgary though most of their key players are very young like their first line of Lindholm, Monahan, and Gaudreau. Gaudreau's, I think, 24, 25 now. Monahan and Lindholm are like 23. You know, like, and that's your first line. Like, they haven't even hit their good phase of their career yet. And Trilliving asked about, was asked about that today in his media conference about, you know, somebody said the window's just opening for this team. And you can go listen to it yourself on the Flames website. He says how he doesn't believe in windows and mentions the process as he always does. But yeah, you're right. I mean, this is not a team that had to go out and blow every future asset they have to do it this year. And as much as, you know, we'd all love to see it this year because of how good the team is. They do have a couple of years to figure this yeah, out. Yeah. Like you got to figure we're the best team in the West and all of our important players are extremely young. Like, we don't have a problem. Young and, and not only on young, or sorry, not only young, but on long-term deals. Yeah, 
Like, we don't have to worry right now about that. You know, and having confidence in the group and, like, the Flames saying to the team that, hey, we think you guys are awesome, we're going to just stand pat because we believe in you, that's a huge confidence boost to all these kids because of the fact that they haven't been to the playoffs much. Like, a handful of guys have only seen the four games against Anaheim. The rest have only seen the, the series against Vancouver and the five games against Anaheim. So, you know, like, it's one of those situations where, like, the organization having confidence in the young players will help just so that way, like, not being worried that, oh, you're going to screw up. <laughs> yeah. Well, and we got to remember in the end, this group that the Flames have assembled ended up taking us this far. Like, there's nothing that makes me believe, you know, this group can't go, I don't want to say all the way maybe to the cup, but that they can't maintain what they're doing now. Like, there's no reason to go out and bring in huge new assets when what we've been doing is obviously working. Exactly. And, like, would it have been awesome to get Stone or Nyquist or Simmons or whomever? Sure. You know, it's always... And I still think we'll see one of those names come here in the summer. Yeah, it it's always fun to go out and get the shiny new toy. It's just that, frankly, Calgary doesn't really need it. And especially with Austin Zarnick coming out of nowhere. Like, he looked really good at, in preseason. And, like, I was kind of expecting him to maybe be a second-line player, like, with... Or third line player. Yeah, you slot him into the middle six for a yeah, while. Yeah, and then he played regular season games and was horrible <laughs> and deserved to be benched. But he's since he's ha had an opportunity, he's looking more like the preseason version of what we saw from him. And like I even think I said offline, uh, either to you or to somebody else, that I could see him getting 20 goals this year. Like, that's what I was, you know, the talent seemed to be there where he could have been that guy. And since he's been back in the lineup, he's looking like a 20-goal type guy. And it's almost like with Smith, where, like, he kind of, like, resurrected himself over the last couple of weeks. I think Zarnik as well, you could kind of count him in that deadline deal acquisition kind of thing, because... Just for reference, Zarnik has played 34 games. He has six goals and four assists right now for 20 points. Ten, but yeah. Or sorry, yeah, sorry, ten points. You're thinking he's going to get to 20. I well, no, the I, at the beginning of the year, like I was expecting him to be like a 20 goal, maybe 40. Oh, 20 goals, not 20 yeah, points. Yeah, 20 goal, maybe 45 point type guy in the middle six yeah i could i could see based on where we're at he could get 20 points i don't think he's gonna get no. 14 more goals no no of course not but he, that was because he was kind of bad for the well up until like six games ago but it, you know if he continues to play well then that's kind of like a deadline deal in and of it itself because he's having the impact that you would expect a middle six forward to have that's new to the team because he wasn't I think he didn't play for like a month and a half prior to Neil's injury so and plus when Neil gets back that'll be another boost to the team so and stone yeah exactly so it, it it's one of those things they have that a, they have enough pieces to look forward to they didn't need to go out and make that big deal yeah like, it'd be different if, like, Neil was out for the season or, you know, and, like, I would have liked to have gotten another guy into the lineup, but them standing pat, that's fine. You know, like, there's, the Flames are ridiculously deep, and, like, Manjapane is emerging as well, and that's a little unexpected. Not really, but, you know, like, him after like 27 games of not scoring and now i think he has three and has looked a lot better in games it, you know we're we're fine you know and it's kind of a strange situation where like it's cool that we didn't have to go waste things to get somebody because all of the other teams needed to do that to try to catch us
Well, let's talk about that without doing without going too deep in any one team because obviously this is a Calgary show. Do you think that I mean, if we look at the uh, the balance of power in the West right now, Calgary's still at the top with eighty five points. They played sixty two games. Uh, we have one game in in hand on San Jose, who's at eighty two points. Winnipeg's at seventy eight. Do you think that we see a big shift in power uh, after the deadline? Do you think first off anybody has made enough moves to overtake Calgary? Well. First, I'm going to just talk about the remaining schedule uh, for the Flames because of the fact that the Flames actually, in the entire NHL, have the single easiest schedule of any team in the NHL. So, like, for remaining games against good teams, we play the Islanders once, Toronto once, Vegas twice, uh, the Winnipeg Jets once, and... That's it. Like, oh, and San Jose once, right near the end of the season. So, like, that, and that's it. And, like, everybody else is, you know, varying degrees of bad. Like, we play Anaheim a couple of times, Edmonton, Vancouver, Ottawa, the Rangers, the Devils. Well, and just a note there, too. I mean, of the remaining 20 games, 11 of them are at home, which is a big deal for this team. Yeah. As well. So, like, our quality of competition most of the teams suck. So the Flames are going to have an easier time to maintain the current pace that they're on. And you look at, like, everybody below Calgary. Uh, like, Vegas is 16 points back. They're not coming anywhere near us. Uh, uh, St. Louis, they're at 72. They're, they're 13 back. They're not catching up. I think there will be some movement through the middle of the West there, but I don't think anyone yeah. gets near Calgary that's not already. Yeah, like even Winnipeg being seven points back, I don't see them making up that kind of ground. No. So like, realistically, the whole Western Conference comes down to a battle between Calgary and San Jose. And we have a slightly, e they have a slightly easy schedule too. It's not as easy as ours is. And I think their next opponent is the Boston Bruins, which, you know, have fun with that. Um, and we have three points, and, like, if we win tomorrow against the New York Islanders, then that's five points on equal footing. So, you know, like, if Calgary can win a few more games and San Jose loses a couple here and there, then, like, that, too, will become an insurmountable lead. And... Like, Calgary is going to either finish first in the conference or second, but, you know, they'll end up playing Vegas in the first round. So, it's a good situation. Like, we're going to probably be playing whichever of Minnesota, Colorado, or Arizona in round one, or Vegas. And Are there any of those teams that scare you now after the deadline that didn't beforehand? I think that if we're, we're first and we go up against, frankly, any of the teams that could possibly, even if Chicago or Vancouver get in, I I don't see that series going more than five games. And, it, like, we'll thump whomever. Uh, if it's Vegas, that'll be, a, like, a six or seven game series and it'll be a coin toss. So, well, I think that also depends how well Flurry's playing. I mean, he's very injury prone. Yeah, that's exactly it. And I have a feeling with them that they're going to lose Flurry before the regular season's over. Just a hunch of mine. Yeah, and they don't really have anything else. So, well, I mean, if we're going into a playoff series against Vegas and we're against what Malcolm Su or Subban is that who? Yeah, yeah. Uh, then like we've got it in the bag, and you don't have to worry. But you know, like what I'm ideally hoping for is the flames get easy opponent of whichever fit fill, falls into the eighth seed and San Jose and Vegas beat the ever loving tar out of each other. And then we pick up, you know, whomever the winner of that is and have a slightly easier time because they're, they had to go through a bit of a war in the first round. Yeah, I think you'll see San Jose, probably Vegas, beat each other up. I think Winnipeg, Nashville will beat each other up. Well, and that's going to work. In I, I think that Nashville will probably end up playing St. Louis in the first round. See, I think Nashville is going to surge ahead of Winnipeg. Eh, I don't know. It's one of those things that, like, I don't. Frankly, I wouldn't even be shocked if St. Louis catches Winnipeg. You know, with how they've been on a roll lately, it, it 
wouldn't shock me if St. Louis ended up winning the division out of nowhere. Which, that would be kind of hilarious, because they were dead last in the NHL on January 3rd. But, you know, um, no, uh, I think that, like, whoever finishes second in the Central and or third, uh, like, that matchup, whether it's Winnipeg or Nashville against St. Louis, like, the they're going to have a, that's going to be a war just like San Jose Vegas, if that's what our division ends up being. And whoever wins that is going to be playing Dallas, most likely. And that's a, a difficult but not insurmountable series for whoever wins the Central. Yeah, I'm looking at the West and the deals are made. If I was in the East, I'd be a little worried. I think Columbus is going to come on hot. Um, but in the West, I think we're, like you said, there might be a little bit of movement in the middle there between three, four, five, maybe even six. I could see Vegas... Um, I could see Vegas maybe overtake St. Louis if St. Louis slows down, but I think Calgary is going to maintain their lead in number one. I think it's going to be close. I can see it coming down to that last road trip for the Flames in uh, in April, but I think Calgary is going to stay as number one. Yeah, I do too. I think they might lose it and then get it back, so I shouldn't stay stay as number one. But I think when eighty two games are played, Calgary will be number one in the West. I think so as well, and it just depends on like if. Like, say, like, the first line gets going again soon, then, like, they could honestly go on a huge... Like, if and if the third and fourth lines continue to roll as they have been, like, this team could pretty much destroy everybody the rest of the way. So, you know, because they only play, like, six games against teams that are even remotely good, and, like, everybody else is either middling or terrible. So... You know, and like we saw the other day against Ottawa, yesterday against Ottawa, like they didn't have a very good game. It was not a cohesive effort by the team, and yet they still walked all over them the entire night. And, you know, I, I could see them doing the same against basically any of the non-playoff teams that they're going up against, and there's a ton of them. Well, and you should if you're first. Yeah, oh I yeah, mean, that's... for sure. It's just, it's nice to be in that position where like and you said getting the first line going i think we can get the first line going but i think by the end of next month you're gonna see them almost shutting that line down again yeah well i think the most imperative i think the big trick is getting lines two three and four scoring in their place yeah. i think the most imperative thing for the rest the remaining 20 games this season is the flames need to win the conference it because it makes their entire lives so much easier just because they basically the first round's a gimme and then the second round they play a battered opponent and you know like if the flames finish second in the division then they have to beat both vegas and san jose instead of just one or the other and you know it, it just it makes everything a lot more difficult if they can their entire road because like you got to figure that with the central all three of the top teams in the central are dynamite hockey teams and the first and second round are going to be a war zone for the central so the flames if they can beat who win the conference and beat the eighth seed they stand a very good chance of beating san jose or vegas whichever is left standing and frankly that series with uh, Vegas getting stone, I think, is more of a toss up than anything. Right now, I think looking at their previous playoff experiences, we just need to get through round one. Yeah, and let's just deal with that first. Yeah, and it, like if they can get through round one, I think that they stand as good of a chance as any of getting to the finals. In which case, you're the entire duration of the playoffs, you're just cheering for whomever is playing against Tampa Bay. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, well, yeah, I mean, I don't I don't want to speculate too much what brackets are going to be. We don't know. We still got a lot of hockey to play with 20 games, maybe as we get near the end of March and we see where things shake out. But, yeah, I agree. If we can get past round one, I mean, I think it's anybody's game in the West at that point. Yeah. It's going to be the team that has the freshest guys, the team that has the deepest bench who can roll out guys that aren't hurt. It's the typical playoff story. Exactly. 
Well, Matt, let's move away from the deadline if there's nothing else you want to talk about and uh, look at some other Flames news because, believe it or not, there's other things going on in the league. Oh, really? I was not aware of that. <laughs> so remember that after the trade deadline, uh, rosters expand. You can have as many guys in the roster as you want, but there is a rule that you can only make four call-ups from the AHL in a non-emergency scenario. The Flames burned one of them today. They made a paper transaction sending Curtis Lazar back to the AHL and then calling him up. I hope he didn't actually like go to no, Stockton. No, it uh, on deadline deal back. they make a, an exception where it's just a paper transaction, so that way everybody saves on airfare. You could just put the Stockton Heat logo on his hotel room and say, "Yeah, he went in yep. there." Um, and so now they have three players left that they can call up for the remainder of the season. All the current players in the NHL roster are ineligible to be sent to the AHL for the remainder of the season, which uh, you look at guys like uh, Mangiapane, you look at guys like uh, Shillington, well, I guess, Shill yeah, Shillington, Anderson, and that doesn't surprise me. I mean, like you said earlier, Mangiapane's getting going. Stockton's not going to make the playoffs. There's no reason to send those guys down. No, and you want Valimaki to be playing first pairing minutes down in Stockton and kicking as much butt as he can so that way when the playoffs happen and he gets recalled that he he's fresh and you know on an upward trajectory instead of you know sitting in the press box which i think that's what he'd be doing right now if he was in the nhl and i don't see him getting recalled before the end of the heat season no neither do i especially now that we've got an you know oscar coming in who can play that game um, the last Heat game is the 14th, which is after the Flames regular season. So maybe they call him up right after the Flames regular season and miss those last three. Yeah. Well, I think that you just don't see... I, I wouldn't be shocked if Val Mackey's already played his last game in the NHL this season. Um, he Unless the Flames get into like major injury trouble. And, you know, which that you can't predict. But I... I think for now you're just you just let him be like one of the black aces and yeah even if they get hurt I mean unless like you said majors one thing but if they just need a fill in guy I mean you've got Prout you got Fantenberg I think for guys playing five minutes a night either one of those guys would be fun yeah and frankly both those guys can play fifteen minutes a night and not be bad so that it's fine like they can play the regular. Uh, third pairing minutes without any difficulty and then this weekend uh big news for flames fans now that we're done the trade deadline the calgary flames will be home after their road trip for the weekend um on saturday night when minnesota comes town and this is when number 12 will be raised to the rafters if you remember ken king said well he's in charge we'd never retire another jersey it'd always be forever a flame well they're retiring another jersey number 12 Jerome McGinley's jersey gets retired. And I don't know what you meant. I'm quite looking forward to this. Oh, I agree. And I'm, it's well deserved. Uh, he, frankly, he was the best player ever to don the Flaming Sea. And both on and off the ice. Yes. Yeah, and there's nothing that you can say that hasn't already be, been said a million times, especially by Craig Conroy. But uh, no, um, he is definitely deserving of a retirement instead of just the forever aflame and frankly the forever aflame guys should also be retired but that's another day and i still i went back the other day and listened to you and i covering that trade and that was a sad day yeah oh yeah well yeah it, it's one of those things that like especially like when like the flames traded theron flurry because uh, I was a huge Flames fan back then, and, like, I remember just being absolutely gutted, and, like, I know that, Me like, too. everybody felt the same way when the Flames traded Jerome McGinley, and, like, you knew it was coming, I knew it was coming, everybody knew it was coming, and it just, like, it, when the deal got announced, it just, it was just as much of a stomach punch as... You know, you knew it was coming, but it still hurt all the same. And, you know, I I was disappointed that he didn't get the Stanley Cup, that he, frankly, should have won. But... As a Flames fan, is that kind of what you remember of number 12? Is that 04? Yeah. Run? Oh, for sure. And, like, that was the Ginla and Kipper show. Star guest starring Martin Jelena to end each series. <laughs> 
Yeah, I think that's what I'm going to remember, too, is that whole playoff run. It was Iggy. I mean, you know, there was even that song, you know, in the dome, in the dome, yeah. chilling with Jerome. Like he, he was the star of the show and he stole everyone's hearts there. And I remember, you know, we traded Joe Newendike for this kid named Aginla. No one was quite sure what we were getting. And, um, you know, he's he was such a great guy on and off the ice. He was very personable. He spent a lot of time doing charity stuff, but probably I think the best flame we've ever had. And I would say it's going to be hard for even modern guys to surpass a lot of his records. Well, put it this way, Gaudreau would have to play as a flame for like another 10 years and win a Stanley Cup to even get mentioned in the same bracket at all as a Ginla. And, you know, it's just a testament to both his abilities and his durability with the team. And, you know, a lot of his numbers are not going to be surpassed anytime soon and deservedly so. Like, he was one of the single best players of his generation. Like, for the 2000s, frankly, I feel that he was the single best player of that decade. And there were a lot of years that he was the guy that kept the Flames interested. Oh, for sure. Like, especially like... If you like, taken Jerome out of a lot of those teams, you would have been nothing. Oh, like, you look at the early 2000s, like, boy, those teams were horrible. <laughs> like, just awful. And, like, it was literally a Ginla and, you know, that was about it. And, you know, if the Flames didn't have him, like, I'm not even sure the Flames are in Calgary anymore, frankly. And well, like here, here's their here's some of the guys in their twenty or two thousand one two thousand two roster: Craig Conroy, Dean McCammond, Mark Savard, Tony Lindman, Igor Kravchuk, Rob Niedermeyer, Clark Wilm, Chris Clark. Like, yeah, it's a bunch of nobodies. Yeah, like there are some good players in there. Like Savard, that was before he got good. Like he was decent when he was with us, but yeah. he didn't really turn on into like first line center until he left. Either guys that you know like Savard had a little bit of potential, or a bunch of you know depth guys, or you look at guys like Bob Bugner who were probably past their prime. Yeah, lots of variations of Garnett Hathaway, basically. <laughs> you know, and that was most of the Flames roster. <laughs> oh wow, Dallas Eakins played for us that yeah, year. Yeah, he did. Um, so, you know, I think you're right. I think he, Jerome was part of the reason this team stayed here. And I think it's Flames fans. It's, it's a good, it's nice to see him up there. We saw him retire in the summer and I'm glad they didn't wait too long. Weird choice to retire against Minnesota, but well, he did score his 500th career goal against the wild. So it does make a little sense. Yeah, I know. I would have either done one of the teams he played for, or since he's from the Edmonton area, do it against the Oilers. Yeah. Well, Everybody's different. Like Patrick Waugh, he wanted uh, both of his jersey retirements with Colorado and Montreal to be games against Calgary because we were the only team that actually beat him in the Stanley Cup Finals. So, well, I also wonder how much of it was Jerome wanting a certain team versus this is when he's available. Yeah, well, we'll see. I'm sure that'll and be. They don't, and they don't really play a lot of home Saturday night games from here on out. Yeah. So. Wow, there's only two. There's Minnesota and Edmonton. That's the only times they're home on Saturdays. Yeah. Um, so the big question I've been asking, some people think I'm silly for even asking this. If you take a look in the rafters of the Saddle Dome right now, there's two jerseys retired, number nine for Lanny McDonald, number 30 for Mike Vernon. They're both wearing what I'll call the white retro style, or not wearing, but the jersey that was put in the rafters is the a banner in the style of the white retro, which is what those guys wore. That's back when we wore white at home. The question that I ask is what, version of the jersey will be depicted on jerome's banner do you do the 04 version of the jersey the one that he wore when he ran to the cup do you do maybe the black horse jersey do you do the red retro what would you do well personally i'd go with the 04 like i know he only wore that jersey i think for two seasons 304 and 0506 but those were frankly the two best seasons for the team as a whole and yeah, you know, like he probably I think he played the most with the modern jersey that we currently wear. But I think for verisimilitude that the Flames will probably put him with the uh, the retro red. Yeah, I think when we talk about the 04 jerseys, um, you know, I kind of look at that cuz you only really see the back of it. It would be the black number era if that makes sense. 
black numbers, white names, like the 04, like the current ones, that could definitely be um, that could definitely be the one they put up there. Knowing the team and what they've done recently, if you look on the Flames website, they have a whole bunch of promo videos about retiring Jerome. And the style of the graphic they're using is the retro style. There's no black in it. It's red with yellow, white, yellow striping. So I have a feeling it's going to be the retro red. Yeah. And knowing Calgary, they'll probably put him in the retro white, even though he never wore that jersey. <laughs> see, I think they'll go the other way. I think that we will see Jerome's retro red raised, and I think they'll change the other two to retro red. Yeah, that would be funny, though, <laughs> if they did that. <laughs> the Forever of Flame ones have a red background. All the other ones have up there have a red background. The whites do stand out because they're not red. Um, so I could see them just changing all the jerseys to be red. Yeah. Which, I don't know, it kind of sucks because that was a time in history, yeah. you know, when white was the home color. But I can see them wanting to do that. Yeah, which it should be again or, you know, have color on color. But that's another argument. You mentioned that a couple times every season. Mike. I know. It irritates me because it's boring. It does. It's red versus white every game. Like, it's boring. <laughs> Um, so yeah, if you're a Jerome fan, um, share with us on Twitter or Facebook on Twitter, we're at fireside podcast on Facebook, we're facebook.com slash fireside chat, share your favorite flames memories leading up to Saturday night and, uh, your favorite memories of, I guess, Jerome's time here, the flames with him or just him. Um, we'd love to hear what your Jerome memories are leading up to that. Cause this is the time for us to reminisce a bit. Yeah. I think a lot of people there are defining moments with the Ginla will be uh, the shift in game five overtime in the Stanley Cup finals. Um, the uh, uh, handshake thing with uh, Trevor Linden and, of course, the golden goal with Sidney Crosby in 2010. That's a big one. Well, should we read some fan mail, Matt? Sure. Do you remember the guy last week who emailed us and said we should bring Brian Burke back? Yeah. He emailed us again. Um, I'll read his email here. It says, Dear Dan, I'm writing to you to ask your advice, as well as that of your colleague Mutt, about an offer I have received recently. The offer arrived in the mail last Wednesday, about the time the doorknob broke. This letter, which was on Rexall Drugs letterhead, included a flyer for two-for-one soap on a rope at any Rexall pharmacy location and invited me to apply for the position of general manager for the Edmonton Oilers Hockey Club. It said the position was currently open and a wide net was being cast for potential applicants, which is why I was approached. And that they heard a letter of mine read on your excellent podcast last week and thought it demonstrated a keen understanding of hockey management. <laughs> Jeez, all I did was suggest my team, the Flames, consider hiring one Brian Burke back as general manager in Calgary to put the almighty fear into the squad. I didn't think it was necessarily a genius suggestion, but the mere idea seems to have turned the local squad around, and it seems to be what is needed in Oil Town. The offer seems like a rather good one. If I accept the job, I would not have to live in Edmonton, which is a big plus, not have to deal with any surly fans, not have to give interviews to the pes pesky puck press, including those guys at Cult of Hockey. I would have to get the Oilers into the postseason, even if I have to use a gun, and I would get a lifetime supply of shampoo, toothpaste, and razor blades. So the question is, what do I do? Please advise ASAP. Uh, is the person that sent this message actually Brent Gretzky? <laughs> no, it's not. You think Brent wants to take Keith's job? Oh, Keith Gretzky. Uh, my mistake. Yeah. Yeah, no, he's he's going by uh, Dilemma in Delborn. Yeah. That's all he's saying his name yeah. is. Yeah. Well, honestly, I do not envy whomever has to deal with that festering pile of, <laughs> you know, that is the Edmonton Oilers. So, if they were smart, I think that the Oilers should go with a new whole management system entirely and get rid of everybody. And, you know, I think that, like, uh, Kyle Dubas in Toronto, like, go with somebody n completely new to being a general manager just because of the fact that they're going to suck for a long time and maybe some fresh ideas might help the team. See, I don't even know. Who, I mean, we won't spend a lot of time talking about Edmonton, but 
I don't even know who would want that job. Like, no one who's been in Edmonton has had a job since in the last, what, 10 years. It seems to be a career killer. If I'm an AHL GM or even assistant GM, I'd almost rather hold Pat than go to Edmonton. Yeah, and that that's mainly just because of the fact that it's a complete crap show. And, like, you, you look at the team, like, they're in seller mode, and they didn't make a single trade today. You know, because nobody wanted anything. And, you know, it's one of those situations where, like, that that team is so bad that, like, it's going to take four or five, six years to properly clean that mess up. And, and that's with having a skilled general manager at the helm. <laughs> I mean, there are other teams that are probably going to be looking for a GM in the offseason. And if I'm anyone that is anybody... Yeah that has any sort of NHL, you know, potential, I would wait for that job before I take the Edmonton job. Yeah. And, you know, like, to be blunt, like, the Oilers have three players that are any good, and that's McDavid, Dreisaitl, and Nugent Hopkins. And, like, Clefbaum's okay, Nurse is okay. And that that's it. it like, that's their entire organization, and they don't really have any prospects coming up that are any good. Like, it's a mess. And a big one. <laughs> and, like, they don't have anything. And it's shocking how bad... Like, you know, like, usually if teams are bad for a while, they start getting some decent secondary players that, you know, start to make the team a little exciting. But they have nothing. And... Like, honestly, I've never seen a team so bereft of talent throughout their organization. Like, even, like, rebuilding teams have better prospects than this. And, like, it's just mind-blowing how bad. <laughs> and I found it amusing that they were saying, Oh, we'll give you Pulu Yarvi if you take Luchitra's contract. Like, even if Puliu Yarvi was doing as good as he was supposed to be from the draft, I don't think that would be enough to take Lucic's contract, let alone him as a reclamation project. I think they'll have to make some deals in the offseason. I don't want to spend too much time in the Oilers. We've done a lot of that but uh, in the past couple of weeks. But I think that they'll have to make – once they get a new GM, I think they'll have to make some moves in the offseason. Oh, for sure. And it's going to be a ton of them. And – it's not going to be too fun for the next couple of years for the Oilers. Better for us. True. One less team in the in the division to contend with. Oh yeah, and always one to make fun of. So we have to have some material besides Flames news on this show. Come on, you know. We got, we, well, we've got whoever this crazy guy is that keeps writing to us. There's our material. Yeah. Well, there's always time to make fun of Edmonton. Though I do like that whoever wrote that said that they got their acceptance letter on Rexall Drugs letterhead. That's the best part of it to yep. me. <laughs> you don't get paid in money. You get paid in free razors. Yep. And oh, Tylenol, did you, you, probably did you hear it. about them? Some guy trying to sell Torelli's like, used clothing? <laughs> no, where did he get it from? Uh, like I guess he left a whole bunch of stuff in Edmonton. And like some guy's trying to <laughs> sell it. And it's like what <laughs> like used like fleece hoodies and like a whole bunch of other things and do they have oilers logos yeah on some of it does and uh, it okay you know uh, one person i heard online said hey you can get fleece just like shirelli <laughs> well it sounds to me like this guy's maybe jumping ship and trying to make you believe it's shirelli stuff like i don't think there's a certificate of authenticity you never know like it might be that he was just cleaning out his office or something and oh there's a whole bunch of stuff here well let's do now what we usually do at the beginning of the show and let's look back at the last week of flames hockey that's something we haven't done yet and then we'll look ahead and uh get out of here it's been a long day of hockey for with the deadline and everything oh yeah so we recorded last week in the middle of the uh, Calgary Arizona game, and Calgary ended up winning that one five to two in the end. On Wednesday, they ended up beating the Islanders uh, four to two. On Friday, they narrowly escaped Anaheim with a two one win, and Ottawa they got another two one win on Sunday. Any of those you want to dig into? Well, um, 
I thought the Islanders game might have been the the single best performance that Mike Smith has had as a Calgary Flame. And then he had what should have been a shutout against Anaheim the next game. So I was at the Islanders game covering it um, from the press box. And I thought on that one, probably the best overall game for the Flames that we've seen. Like, there was a lot of good shots. They did a really good job in their own zone of not coughing up the puck, of taking away New York's shooting lanes. Like, I just thought a really good overall game of Flames hockey. Yeah, they completely neutered the Islanders, frankly. Like, they... they like every time the Islanders tried to jump dump the puck in Smith was there to fire it back to one of the defensemen and out it went and like the Islanders just could not get anything going and considering they're one of the top teams in the NHL it was remarkable to see how much they completely dominated the Islanders and it kind of leaves me a little worried for the next game because we play them tomorrow (laughs) that you know some retribution will occur but We'll see. It was just very encouraging as a game to see them doing so well. Um, the Anaheim game, Anaheim played better than I thought they would, but um, we saw Mangiapane score, which is nice, but I thought Calgary also didn't play as well as they needed to. Yeah, it, well, Anaheim was kind of like trapping the entire game, and it was an extremely boring game, frankly, and... The Flames had a hard time penetrating the trap, frankly, for most of the game. And they got the one goal off Megna in the, early in the second period. The, Smith with that weird giveaway, which happens. And then Eat Bread passing it off Megna and then shooting it past Miller. I, I thought that the Flames played well considering the fact that they're not used to a blanket trap like Anaheim was playing and Anaheim needs to rebuild like now frankly and then on Sunday we saw David Riddick take to the net again which I think was sooner than some of us thought and when the Flames won two to one over I guess the best way to say it at that point because all their stars were either scratched or traded was Kachuk and company yeah in ottawa and this was a game where it the flames should have like if you're going based off of chances on how the team played they probably would have won that game 10 to 1 it's just that everything seemed a little off with their shooting and like the first line seemed off all night and they didn't really get anything going and Ottawa is terrible and like well and really I mean it was a Sunday night game there wasn't a lot of reason for the Flames to really you know play their best and I hate to say it that's one of the luxuries you have when you're number one like it's the Ottawa Senators they're a terrible team you don't need the win maybe you can afford to take the the night off and kind of coast and still get the win once in a while yeah. and Zarnik a win's a win right it doesn't matter how we get the two points yeah well, you'd like to see more encouraging signs from the team. Like, they're on a five-game winning streak. And the first line has been, frankly, terrible in all five of the games. And it's just been the depth guys that have led the way. And, like, that's extremely encouraging that the depth guys can cause a five-game winning streak and when the first line's not playing at all. And... Moving forward into next month, the f- the first line needs to get going. Like, especially against the Islanders tomorrow. Like, they, they need to score at least a goal or two between the three of them. And and we've seen that first line mixed up this past week, too. For a lot of the games, we've seen Goudreau, Monaghan, and Kachuk on a line. Backlund, Bennett, and Lindholm on a line. So the coach trying to, I think, ignite both lines by moving guys around a little yeah, bit. Yeah, and... You know, thank God for Zarnik and Manjapane the last week because the Flames probably don't win a few of those games if not for those two players. So uh, it's good that we're getting contributions from the depth guys, but, you know, the first line needs to get going if the Flames are going to 
make a push to win the conference. And uh, the Islanders just shut out Vancouver uh, two days ago. And, you know, they're looking for some retribution after getting thoroughly embarrassed, frankly, this week. So by us and we're gonna have you know that game could easily go awry just because of that and the flames need to be on the top of their game if they want to get two points so mike smith will be starting in new york which means i would imagine riddick starts the next night in new jersey uh tuesday night in new york against the islanders a 5 p.m start 5 p.m again on the 27th and then Saturday back here at the Dome, an 8 p.m. start for the Jersey retirement. Just a note on that one that I guess the Jersey retirement ceremony starts at 6.30. So if you're going to the game, be there early. Yeah. If you want to be part of all the ceremonies. Um, so, Matt, we got back-to-backs, our only ones really until the end of March. Uh, we have one more set on the road. It's the typical Vegas, Arizona uh, trip. But what are you expecting, New York, New Jersey, uh, Minnesota and then Toronto on Monday, four games. Uh, I'm expecting them to lose tomorrow to the Islanders just because the the first line and the second line have been kind of mediocre, and the Islanders have something to prove after last week. Uh, the two games against the lesser teams, they should win them regardless. Uh, that's the team. That's the one against New Jersey and Minnesota. And Minnesota. Yeah, because Minnesota got rid of a few more. They're decent players, and they're looking like they're going into a bit of a rebuild themselves. Um, and Toronto, I think the Flames will beat Toronto. So, uh, one and three, or three and one this week. So, you think that they're going to lose? We well, said they'll lose to New York, and then they'll win Toronto, New Jersey, and Minnesota. Yeah. I think they're going to get three wins, but I think they're going to win everything but Toronto. Oh, yeah. Um, I think back here, I don't know, Toronto, I think, is going to surge a little bit. They're they're a good team this year. And uh, I don't know, I, I think the Flames will have some difficulty with yeah, them. Yeah, I find it a kind of... I feel a little sad for Toronto because in round one, they're destined to play Boston because there's no way they can catch Tampa and there's no way Montreal can catch either of them. So, you know, and... Boston's going to beat Toronto in the first round. <laughs> and like it's disappointing for the Toronto fans because of the fact that like they're going up basically against the second best team in the NHL and perhaps the best built for the playoffs of all of the eastern teams. And you know, it just it, it's frustrating I I'd imagine like if what happened like should happen happens. Like you were saying, the Flames have some mediocre opponents coming up with... I think they can beat New the Islanders, but with New Jersey, Minnesota, I think they're going to get to the Toronto game. They're not going to have enough firepower to beat Toronto, and it's going to be one of those, okay, guys, we're, we can't coast anymore with our third and fourth line doing all the work. Yeah, well, I... I and I think that might be the, the eye-opener there. Yeah, and I'm hoping that comes against the Islanders, that eye-opener that, you know, like, you guys need to get going. And, you know, again, the... First line, guys, they're all extremely good hockey players. They will get going, and they will, you know, it just, a puck needs to go in for them, or two, and then everything's fine, and they're back off to the races. It's just, for whatever reason, it's not clicking right at the moment. And looking ahead to sort of the overview of the March schedule, lots of home games here. If you haven't seen a Flames game yet, or you want to see them play still, this is the month to do it. They've got pretty much every week, they've got two or three games here. They play Minnesota, Toronto, Vegas, New Jersey, the Rangers, the Blue Jackets, Ottawa, LA, Dallas, and Anaheim at home. So that's what, 11 games? And they've got, or 10 games, I guess, and they've got only f five on the road. So they'll be here a lot. Um, they're all weekday games, except for one of them. But if you want to see this team still, now's the time to see them. It's... Uh, They've only got one game here in April before the ticket price gets jacked up for the playoffs. So this is the time to come support the team. Nice that they're all pretty much 7 o'clock starts, easy to remember. And as Matt mentioned, fairly easy schedule for the Flames. Yeah, that, well, the one good thing is that most of the opponents are like basically coasting for the rest of the way. That they play, like, 
they're either way too far out of it or they're just not very good in the first place so you know it like arizona is not a very good team like even though they're close and like everybody else it they're they just suck frankly so the flames have a lot of good easy opponents like especially once they get through this week and the uh, the two vegas games next week like the rest of the way like all of their games except for one against san jose are against and one against winnipeg are against easy opponents so well, and not only easy opponents, easy road trips. Like, we've got the Vegas-Arizona game. They got a couple days uh, off after that. They've got one quick trip up to Winnipeg, then two days off. One quick, quick trip to Vancouver with a day off on either side. Like, even the road games are going to be pretty easy yeah. this month. Yeah, and then at the end of the month and beginning of April, they play. They go on a California trip, which two of the three teams are horrible. And, you know, then the, and the Sharks, so... And we get the Sharks first, so that also helps. So it looks like the Flames could end this one out strong. Yeah. Well, they need to, and especially with the fact that like, they are three points up on San Jose with the game in hand. If they can just roll a handful of wins together and like make that five or seven points, then like you're getting into insurmountable area and the team can kind of coast a little bit, especially as they're playing a lot of mediocre teams. The rest, like for like the, it's, it's, it should be a good schedule for the flames. We've, we talked about earlier and I I think you, you know, you've let everyone know what was going on there, but yeah, it's going to be easier teams for the team for the flames. And I think we're going to see the first and second line probably shut down. And I think that'll be, good that we have easier teams at that point yeah like you look at the next seven games and four of the seven are against good teams and then for the remaining 13 games only two are against good teams and even those good teams i mean they're going to be shutting their players down as well yeah so you know like i'm hoping that basically the flames by the time they play san jose at the end of the march on the last day of march that like they already have the conference wrapped up by then or are close enough where like they just need another win or two. I think it'd be kind of fun if that was the game that we had to win to sort of secure it. Yeah, I agree. Well, Matt, I think that's about it for this trade deadline episode. Kind of a boring deadline, but it's going to be a fun week with the Iggy retirement, and I will talk to you next week. Yeah, it was a nice one to recap, and I'm actually kind of glad that the Flames didn't have to do anything and that everybody else is trying to catch us. It's a weird place for us to be in as Flames fans. I know. It is so foreign. It's nice, though. Let's hope. And, you know, hopefully over the next few years we get used to this. <laughs> for sure. Thanks for listening, right, everyone. We'll talk to you next week, my friend. Yep. Thanks for listening, everyone. Have a good week. And as always, go Flames, go. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.